You're not? Oh, I am. I'm ready for the rain. Bah humbug, right? All right. So before I was so rudely interrupted yesterday, um, I was talking about uh, the uh, general process of transcription. So I want to go back to that and uh, say something about that. So um, as I was saying, and I was uh, at the point of elongation. And elongation uh, of transcription um, occurs after the sigma factor has left. So you see the sigma factor is right here. We're starting to add new nucleotides to this, and the sigma factor is gone. So you can see that there's several. Each end there is a new nucleotide that's been added. And so as the, we enter the elongation phase, the sigma factor goes away. It's not needed anymore because the sigma factor is the thing that's helping the rest of the RNA polymerase to recognize the promoter. If the promoter's already been recognized, the sigma factor can go out now and help another RNA polymerase recognize the promoter. And you'll notice that I'm saying you know, a sigma factor as if it's separate from an RNA polymerase, but it actually works with it. That's what it does. OK. Well, elongation is pretty uneventful. Elongation uh, doesn't happen nearly as rapidly as DNA replication does. Okay? So DNA replication in, uh, in bacterial cells goes at the rate of about 1,000 nucleotides a second. Transcription, by contrast, goes at about 50 nucleotides a second. A lot slower. A heck of a lot slower. All right? Now, there's no need to go much faster because if it goes, uh, if it goes you know, really crazily fast, it may have trouble stopping, as we will see. And stopping is important. It's not important for DNA replication because you want to get all the way through that giant DNA. In the case of transcription, we're typically only making a few thousand nucleotides, not a few million. Okay? So there's a very, very big difference between the needs of transcription and the needs of DNA replication. OK. Well, um, as I said, the um, process of transcription proceeds um, until um, we get to the end. And so the end is important. How does the um, cell know, or how does the, DNA, the RNA polymerase know where to stop transcription? Okay. How does it know that? Well, I'm going to describe to you two different mechanisms that bacterial cells use to identify where to stop. Okay. The first, and in fact, they're both kind of cool. The first is called factor-independent termination. Factor-independent termination. Now, factor-independent termination relies on a sequence in the DNA. It relies on a sequence in the DNA, such that when the RNA polymerase copies that sequence, something kind of cool happens. Okay? Well, the sequence that's contained in the DNA is something we call an inverted repeat. Okay? And that inverted repeat, what an inverted repeat means is that the two parts that you see there are inverted with respect to each other. And you might wonder how that is the case. Here's the top sequence from 5 prime to 3 prime, A, A, G, G, C, T, C, C. And down here from 5 prime to 3 prime going from right to left, A, A, G, G, C, T, C, C. They're inverted with respect to each other and they're repeated. That's what that means. Okay. Now, what that means is if an RNA polymerase copies that, then if I just read the top strand, I see A, A, G, C, T, blah, 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 blah right? And then I come back down, and I see G, G, A, G, C, C, U, U. And look at that. They can form a perfect set of base pairs. Okay? This creates something. And, and they will pair like that. If you put them next to each other, they'll just make base pairs just like that. You already saw how ribosomal RNAs, for example, can form base pairs within themselves. You saw some pretty elaborate structures of that. This is a very simple one. It's called a stem loop. Stem loop. Okay? It's also called, some people call it a hairpin. Okay? A stem loop or a hairpin. Now, the important thing is that that loop forms. All right? Well, here's the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase is just a little bit ahead of that. And the RNA polymerase has just finished 
making a U, 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 U. What are UA base pairs like? They're weak, right? They're not as strong as GCs, right? There's not as many hydrogen bonds holding them together, right? Well, what happens is this guy forms, and the RNA polymerase was sitting on this flat messenger RNA until all of a sudden, spoink, this thing formed. All right? Guess what happens? Remember, this is sitting on the DNA because it's copying the DNA. It lifts the butt end of the RNA polymerase up. All right? It's physically lifting it up, just like a jack on a car will lift a car up. It lifts the butt end of the RNA polymerase up, and the RNA polymerase, which is touching the DNA, and the RNA polymerase says, whoops. Right? And the RNA polymerase is loosened. And not only is it loosened, but now there's the only thing that's holding the whole thing together are these little UA base pairs. And they're not strong enough to hold it together. And everything falls apart. And in this case, falling apart is good because the RNA falls off of the DNA. The RNA polymerase falls off of the DNA. That bubble of the DNA where the strands were apart comes back together. And everybody's happy. What we have done is we have just terminated the process of transcription. And it happened because this sequence was contained in the DNA that was being copied. Now, many genes in bacteria have this kind of a structure. Not all of them. Many have this, that is this sequence that's here. Many have that sequence, but not all of them. This is called a terminator sequence. It's a terminator. That inverted repeat is a terminator. It's a terminator sequence. Okay. That's a good question. This is a pretty common sequence, but it's not absolutely exact. Good question. Yeah. OK. Well, but the point is that this is a nice way of, 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 of stopping transcription at a very specific point. right? This means when the RNA polymerase gets there, it's going to get basically lifted off of the DNA, and transcription is going to stop. It's not the only way of stopping transcription, because like I said, not all genes have this sequence. Others rely on this other process I'm going to describe to you called factor dependent. And factor dependent is kind of cool in its own way as well. And to give you an idea about how, how factor dependent works, I need to, first of all, describe it briefly to you, and then give you an analogy. Okay? So what you see on the screen now is a depiction of that transcription elongation going on. So here is the messenger RNA that's made. You see it forms base pairs for a little ways, at least. And then the tail of it hangs off. Okay. The RNA polymerase is right there. This particular gene doesn't have a terminator sequence. All right. You notice there's something up here. It looks like it says P factor, but that P is actually a rho, R-H-O, Greek symbol rho. Rho, rho, rho your boat. All right. I know I don't have a song about rho. All right. All right. But rho is a protein that has a very cool way of acting. Okay? You'll notice it's a circle, and in that sense, it reminds us of the beta clamp that went around the nucleic acid and held the DNA polymerase closer. Well, this row isn't doing that. This row is, in fact, going to do something, but it's not going to hold anything closer. In fact, it's going to loosen everything up. Row recognizes the 5 prime N, that's the 5 prime N right there, of the messenger RNA and says, oh, look, I can climb onto here. And it does. And it starts climbing, OK? It starts climbing this messenger RNA. Now, the analogy I want to give you is how many of you in gym class had to climb a rope? OK? Did you guys like that or not? Yeah. Did? The first time I did it, I hated it. But then after I got used to it, it was kind of cool. But I remember as a kid, I just uh, didn't like looking down, right? All right? Well, imagine that you're in gym class and you're climbing that rope, OK? And instead of the rope being attached to the ceiling, someone at the top is slowly letting it out as you're trying to climb. Kind of an unsettling thought, right? It's kind of an unsettling thought. Well, 
That's actually what's happening here. All right? If somebody's letting out the rope as you're trying to climb it, you've got to climb it faster than they're letting it out if you ever hope to make it to the top. Right? So there's a race between what you're doing and the, what the person at the top is doing letting the rope out. Well, the rope being let out here is the RNA that's being made by the RNA polymerase. This is a race. It's a race between how fast Rho climbs the rope, that is, the messenger RNA, and how fast the RNA polymerase is copying the RNA. It turns out that Rho will eventually catch the RNA polymerase. And when it does, it does the same thing that the uh, uh, terminator sequence did. It lifts the RNA polymerase off, everything falls apart, and transcription is done. Now you'll notice that because this is a race, okay, we don't have a specific place that transcription stops. We'll have a general place, about the, the usual place where it will catch it, but we don't have a specific, here's this sequence, here's where it's going to stop. We can look at the sequences of the places where it stops, and we can actually measure this. And what we find is something kind of interesting. Okay? If we look at the messenger RNAs that are made, they will tend to end in GC base pairs. I'd like you to think about what that means. What does that mean? Say it again. Well, they're, they're actually going to be harder to pull apart, right? That's a clue. Yes? You're, you're frowning. Does it end with a U? No. It doesn't end with a U. It's ending with GCs. This is general. This is not an absolute thing. But in general, that's where they will tend to, to end. Did you sort of say something else? No, not quite. There's not a UA at the end. Why do you suppose it would stop at GCs? It, the clue is that it is harder to pull things apart. Well, doesn't the RNA polymerase have to move through the bubble? Doesn't the, don't the two strands of the DNA have to be pulled apart? And won't it be harder for the RNA polymerase to get the strands apart as it's going through there? The stop sites will tend to be GCs because that's where the polymerase slows down to get things pulled apart. Okay, So in this case, it's stopping more at GCs because it's harder to get the two strands apart. So the RNA polymerase slows down, and that's a good place for Rho to catch it. Because Rho is pretty much going at a pretty constant rate. If we look at an RNA polymerase, it will tend to go faster through AT regions and slower through GCs, and then faster through ATs, and then slower through GCs. So in general, we will see the factor, in, I'm sorry, the factor dependent method, which is this one, the row method, will tend to have things that will stop at GCs. OK. Well, um, that's uh, kind of cool, all right? If we look at. Some schematic diagrams of this. What we discover is that I've shown you some simple things, OK? So I have a minus 10, I have a minus 35. But in fact, genes can have other regions of sequence that play roles in determining whether transcription occurs or not, OK? That play roles in that. And if we look at those, we see comparing gene to gene, again, we see some common sequence features. And wherever we see common sequence features, I always want you to think of there's a protein that recognizes that. That protein may play a role in determining whether or not transcription occurs. Okay, That's part of what's here. You also see the term element. All right? Elements are simply sequences. So a core element, or a, 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 I'm sorry, in this case, a UP element is an upstream sequence. That's what UP is standing for there, OK? UP element, all right? So an element is simply a sequence. You think of an element as carbon or something, right? All right. 
OK, now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the most studied gene uh, system in E. coli. It's called the LAC operon, L-A-C. And it's kind of cool, OK? L-A-C. L-A-C is short for lactose. Lactose is the sugar that's found in milk. Okay? It's the sugar that's found in milk. And bacteria can metabolize lactose. Now, I'm not a big milk drinker. Okay? In fact, I rarely drink milk. I don't have an awful lot of lactose in my digestive system. Okay? The bacteria in my digestive system recognize that, hey, this guy doesn't drink much milk. There's not much lactose here. One of the reasons that we think about the need to control the synthesis of proteins is the synthesis of proteins is very energetically expensive. It takes a lot of energy to make a protein, a lot of ATP energy. So cells don't want to be making proteins that they're not going to use. They don't want to make proteins that they're not going to use. So having a sense of what proteins are needed is really helpful for conserving energy. Okay? So what I'm getting ready to describe to you is a very simple system, but a very cool system that E. coli uses to sense, do I need to make genes to break down lactose or not? Everybody with me? Okay. So this is a system that's going to tell me if, or not tell me, but tell the bacterial cell if it needs to make genes that break down lactose or not. Okay. So here's how it goes. If we look at this, there, we see that there is, there's the minus 1 region. And we see that next to the minus 1 region is the place where RNA polymerase binds. And you would say, well, around minus 10, I would expect to probably see a, um, a, a Pribno box, and you would. And you would expect to see something up around minus 35, and you would. So you'd see kind of promoters there. But one of the interesting things that you see is, and here's a hint, okay? One of the interesting things that you see is that the Pribno box isn't a very good Pribno box. What did I tell you about not good Pribno boxes? Does anyone remember? It doesn't make very much RNA, mRNA, right? So to start with, this guy isn't going to make very much to begin with. But basically, he doesn't want to make any if there's no lactose. Whereas if I go out and I drink a gallon of milk, all of a sudden I got a bunch of lactose, this bacterium says, whoa, there's some energy I could use. I want to start making en enzymes that break that down, OK? All right. So. You'll notice that there's a couple of other things here. There's actually something that's up in this region that, that it's not marked, but I'll describe to you. It's called the operator. Okay? And there's something way up here called the cap binding site. So if we go cap binding site, okay, we, and in fact, this, this whole region, I should say, the whole region itself is called the operator. All right? But within that, we've got a minus 35, we've got a minus 10. Okay. That's where we start to begin to understand how this gene system works. All right? Now, the O there stands for the operator. And what we see is that this is what we call an operon. Right? Bacteria have an organization of genes that's different than we do. Remember we had genes in pieces? We only had one gene per messenger RNA. Might be pieces, but only one gene per messenger RNA. Bacteria have clustered genes that have similar functions next to each other. That's called an operon. I'm going to give you a definition for an operon. An operon is a group of genes in bacteria that are all under the control of the same promoter. They're all under the control of the same promoter. Now, if you look at this picture on the screen, you see two situations. The first situation, there's no messenger RNA being made. And in the second situation, 
there's a messenger RNA that's being made, and it's actually copying three genes, LACZ, LACY, and LACA. The only gene that we're going to worry about is LACZ. But all three are actually made. They're actually, and they're made, as you'll notice, on one messenger RNA. Well, how is the difference between here and here? I'll tell you, first of all, that you could imagine that with no transcription, this would be a situation where there's no lactose. And if we see transcription, it must be occurring when lactose is present. And that's correct. OK? Well, how does a cell tell between those two? It's very cool what it does. There's another gene, there's a gene or a protein that the cell contains called the LAC repressor. It's a very important protein, the LAC repressor. The LAC repressor basically helps this system to function. Okay? You'll notice that the LAC repressor gene, which is right there, is right next to the gene, the LAC operon that I've described. It's not a part of the LAC operon. It's separate from it, but it's right next to it. That turns out to be convenient. Okay? The cell is always making a little tiny bit of LAC repressor. The cell is always making a little tiny bit of LAC repressor. There's always a little bit of LAC repressor in the cell. Its name suggests that it's repressing the LAC operon, meaning repression, meaning it's turning it off. It's stopping it from being made. And normally, when there's no lactose present, that's exactly what the LAC repressor is doing. How is it doing it? It binds to the operator. And when it binds to the operator, RNA polymerase cannot bind to the operator. Therefore, if RNA polymerase can't bind, no transcription occurs. Okay. The operator is where the promoter is, remember? So therefore, the promoter is being covered by the LAC operon. RNA polymerase never even sees the promoter. It can't bind. It can't start transcription. Very, very important. OK. Well, what happens when lactose is present? If I go out and I have a bunch of ice cream, or I have a milkshake, or I drink a glass of milk, I get lactose in my system. And when I have lactose in my system, a little bit of that lactose makes it into these cells, the E. coli cells. Okay? A little bit of lactose makes it in. Remember we saw a lac transport protein earlier? I showed you a protein that was in the membrane that moved lactose. All right. Lactose makes it into the cell. It turns out that the lac repressor can bind to lactose. So the lac repressor binds to lactose. And by the way, if you read different books, you'll see la this, this thing that I'm, that I'm calling lactose is actually a slightly different molecule. But for our purposes, I'm keeping it simple. And we're going to call it lactose. Okay. It binds to lactose. When it binds to lactose, the repressor, underline this, cannot bind to the operator. This is so simple, so cool, so beautiful. It's a way of telling the RNA polymerase, right, lactose is present or not present. When there's no lactose, the repressor is not bound to lactose. It binds to the operator and turns off transcription. When lactose is present, the repressor binds to lactose. It can't bind the operator, and RNA polymerase can bind the operator and get started. Very simple. Simple systems are the best systems. This is a very, very simple system. Now, there's one other element of it that's kind of cool. Okay? Remember I said that the Pripno box was not a very good one. What if the cell had encountered a whole ton of lactose? Wouldn't it want to make a bunch of genes? Oh, by the way, I should tell you what these genes do. LACZ breaks down lactose. LACZ breaks down lactose. 
That's why this, this operon is being made. So it can start breaking down lactose, and the cell can get the energy from the sugars in lactose. That's what this gene is allowing to have happen. All right? Very, very cool. So the enzyme is called, the, the enzyme is called beta-galactosidase. You see its name down here. And it is the product of the LAC-Z gene. The enzyme that's made is called beta-galactosidase. All right. I said that there wasn't very much of this messenger RNA being made, which means that there wouldn't be very much beta-galactosidase. And what if the cell is, is swimming in lactose, which it would be if I drank a glass of milk? Okay. Well, it turns out there's one other protein that plays a role in this. Okay. Let's go back to the figure I showed you just a minute ago. You'll notice the operator was right here, which is where the lac operator was, uh, I'm sorry, where the lac repressor was binding, right? There's something over here called a cap binding site. Cap is another protein. And cap binds to this region right here, the cap binding site. Okay. What does cap do? Cap acts a little bit like a sigma factor. It actually helps the RNA polymerase to bind and to get started. So what it's helping the RNA polymerase to do is to bind, even though the RNA polymerase doesn't bind the primno box very efficiently, this guy, this cap protein that sits right here, is helping the RNA polymerase to bind and get started. As a consequence, cap is making the RNA polymerase make a ton of the messenger RNA. When does cap bind to its sequence? Well, there's always a little bit of cap in the cell as well. The cap binds to the sequence when it binds to a molecule called cyclic AMP, or you can call it CAMP, C-A-M-P. And CAMP says, there's plenty of lactose here. There's plenty of lactose here. OK? So what happens if CAP binds and the lac repressor binds? What do you suppose would happen? Who's going to win? The repressor will win. Because the repressor is covering up the region that's necessary for the RNA polymerase to bind. Even if CAP's there, it doesn't make any difference. The only way that CAP works is if the repressor is bound to lactose. In which case, then CAP helps the polymerase to bind, and transcription begins gangbusters. Cool system. Now I'll stop and take questions. Yes? So CAMP is a molecule that's made when cells need a lot of energy. And it's a signal that there's lactose. Okay? It's a signal that there's lactose. So consequently, the cell is getting information that, 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 that I'm sorry, the, the, the cap protein is getting information that it's time to bind. So when cap binds, when cyclic AMP is present, cap binds to it and starts this whole process. If cyclic AMP is not present, CAP won't bind to that sequence. Yes? With any amount of lactose, yes. I keep saying it's simple, and I keep saying it's more complex, right? Other questions? Yes? Yes? OK, so his question, question is, uh, talking about termination, are the two systems I described present in eukaryotic cells? Eukaryotic uh, transcription is extraordinarily different than prokaryotic. It's extraordinarily more complex. There are proteins in eukaryotic cells that will help to stop transcription appropriately, yes. But I'm not going to go into that, because it's way more than what we could talk about in this class. 
In fact, I will say very little. I, I just say a little bit about eukaryotic transcription after this. But eukaryotic transcription is very, very complicated. Because remember that in eukaryotes, we have DNA wrapped around proteins. We have the histone proteins and so forth. So part of eukaryotic transcription requires those proteins to be loosened from that DNA so that the polymerase can get in there. And that's a very complicated process. Yes? Um, maybe like an instance where like a cell can just move backwards independent of the factor independent. Yeah, it's a very good question. So he's trying to figure out whether the cell uses factor independent termination or factor dependent termination. It's not completely understood, but clearly where there's no um, sequence that would give rise to factor independent, that is nothing that has a stem loop, that will always require always use factor dependent. Will factor-dependent termination play a role in the, the, even if that sequence is present? And the answer is it probably will. But that, again, is beyond what we're going to talk about here. OK? Good questions. Yes? Very good question. Okay, question is, why have a lousy Pripno box here? Okay, why not just have a very efficient Pripno box instead of having this cap business? Okay, the answer, I can only speculate, because when I well, what we see at the end of evolution is always uh, the product, and we can only guess the answer to that question. But my guess to that answer to that question, I think, is a reasonable one. Okay, and that is. The fact that without, let's, let's imagine that I get a signal that says, or the, the cell gets a signal that says, oh, there's lactose here, but we don't, you know, we're doing pretty well for energy. The cell probably doesn't want to make a ton of protein to break down lactose because it's already sitting pretty well for energy. It would be making more than it needed. So using that low efficiency Pribno box, would still give it about the level that it needed. What CAP is always going to do is it's going to kick everything into high gear, and then that's it. And so if I had a high efficiency Pribno box, then the same thing would happen. It would always kick into high gear, and I wouldn't have a way of modulating. I wouldn't have a way of making a lower amount of messenger RNA. Does that make sense? That's probably why that's the case. Um, the falling off wouldn't necessarily occur. No, that wouldn't. The falling off wouldn't be a factor relevant to cap. No. Okay. It'd be a question of whether it bound or not. But once it gets started, it's going to it's going to stay on. Yeah. Okay. Is that a question? Are you scratching your head? Okay. All right. So that's the lac operon. Pretty cool uh, stuff in the lac operon. Okay. Now I'll tell you about one that's more complicated. Oh boy. Right. I'm going to try to keep it simple for you. This one's called the tryptophan operon. And whenever you hear the word operon, I want you to think multiple genes on one messenger RNA. In the case of the lac operon, you saw three genes that were on that messenger RNA. In the case of the tryptophan operon, there are 10 genes. Well, 10 genes is quite a few genes. And 10 genes, if the cell were to make the entire operon, would be a pretty good investment of energy just making the messenger RNA, let alone the proteins inside of it. Okay? The tryptophan operon is called the tryptophan operon because the, the pro proteins that are coded there help the cell to make the amino acid tryptophan. Bacteria have to make everything themselves. They're not like we are, where we get to eat amino acids that somebody else made. Bacteria have to basically make them themselves. Okay. Because it takes 10 genes to make tryptophan, or 10 proteins to make tryptophan, because it takes 10 proteins, the cell doesn't, definitely doesn't want to be making those proteins if it's got plenty of tryptophan. However, as tryptophan starts running low, 
the cell wants to be able to say, hey, you better make me some more tryptophan because we're going to run out. If we run out of an amino acid, we're hosed. So tryptophan in the cell will either be high or it'll be low. Okay? Keeping it simple. High or low. It will never run out of tryptophan because if it does, the cell's dead. Okay? So it's high or low. That's basically what's going on. All right. It turns out that this um, operon is controlled in a very unusual and interesting way. But as we will see, there are other operons that mimic it. Okay? This is what it looks like. We have an operator just like um, we had before. Okay? We have a whole bunch of tryptophan genes. This shows five of them. They're actually, I'm sorry, this, this shows um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are actually 10 genes. So you don't see the entire operon. There's also a region here called the attenuator. And the attenuator turns out to be a sequence that's coded in the DNA that gets made into the messenger RNA. Okay. Now to understand how this process works, I have to tell you a little bit about how translation occurs. Okay. So translation is the synthesis of protein. And translation occurs when a ribosome binds to the messenger RNA and starts reading the sequence and the sequence is comprised of three nucleotide sequences called codons. All right? Each three nucleotides corresponds to a specific amino acid. So the ribosome reads that and says, oh, here's a UGA. That should be tryptophan. Okay? Here's, I'm sorry, a UGG. Here's a, a UGG. This is tryptophan. No, you're not going to memorize the genetic code. I only know a couple of them myself. Right. Here's an AUG. Here's methionine. All right. So it knows I've got to grab a tryptophan and put it into this growing protein chain. That's what a ribosome is doing. All right. So if you know that, you can begin to understand what's happening. If we look at the tryptophan operon, we discover that almost all the time, initiation is occurring on the tryptophan operon. Almost all the time. So it's always on. Well, that's sort of runs counter to what I told you. The cell doesn't want to be making it unless it needs it. Well, there's two situations. When there's high tryptophan, it turns out that it always starts, but it doesn't finish making the entire operon. It only works up to the attenuator sequence. And then it stops. When there's low tryptophan, the entire operon is synthesized. That is, that messenger RNA has all 10 genes, and they're all made. Okay. Well, from the requirement point of view, this makes sense. High tryptophan, we don't want to make all these, so we don't. Low tryptophan, we want to make all these, so we do. I say we. It's the bacterial, bacterium that's doing this. Okay. We're all living things. I guess that's, the, that's the, the sense of the we. All right. So how does it do it? Well, it turns out to be kind of cool. The process is called attenuation because it uses an attenuator. What you see on the screen is the sequence of the messenger RNA that's being made. And you see it in two different ways. The way that you see it on the left is what happens when there's plenty of tryptophan. And the way that you see it on the right, it's the same messenger RNA, is what happens when there's very little tryptophan. OK? The one on the left forms, look at that. There's a stem loop. And what did you learn about stem loops in terms of terminating transcription? This stem loop forms, transcription terminates. That's why it makes that little short Messenger RNA, that attenuator sequence has a terminator in it. And there's the terminator. Well, why doesn't it form over here? It turns out it doesn't form over here because if we look at this, we can see this guy can really form base pairs in two different ways. Here 
is what, the green is what I'll call sequence number one. The blue is sequence number two, and the purple is three and four. Here we see one paired to two and three paired to four. When three pairs with four, we get termination because there's a terminator sequence. However, if two pairs to three, if two pairs to three, three and four can't pair, so the termination sequence does not occur, and no, this does not stop the, the, the transcription. The termination does not occur, and RNA polymerase says, oh, I'm off and running, and it goes and makes the entire rest of the operon. Well, how does the cell know, this one or this one? Okay. You understand that this is a terminator, this is not a terminator, right? Don't say yes if you don't. Professor will always say that, right? So I don't want to hear anybody really question me about my stuff, right? All right? That makes sense? Termination, not termination, right? Plenty of tryptophan, little tryptophan. How does plenty of tryptophan cause this to happen, but not this? I'm going to describe this one on the right to you first, OK? Remember I said in bacterial cells that transcription and translation are both occurring pretty much at the same time. I showed you that messenger RNA being made, and I showed you the ribosomes slithering their way along there, translating that protein as the RNA polymerase was doing its thing. The RNA polymerase is about up here. And it turns out that the ribosomes say, oh, there's the 5' prime end of a messenger RNA. Let's start translating that into protein. So the ribosome comes on here, it grabs a hold, and it starts reading three base sequences one at a time. Look at what is there, UGG, UGG. And looking over there, UGG stands for tryptophan. When the ribosome hits that UGG, it looks for tryptophan because it needs to put tryptophan into this protein that's being made. But what if tryptophan is low? The ribosome is going to sit there and wait for more tryptophan. It's going to take longer for tryptophan to be found by the ribosome. The ribosome is going to do what we call pausing. It's going to sit and wait for tryptophan. There's no tryptophan. Or there's little, I shouldn't say there's no, there's little tryptophan. It's going to take longer. So the ribosome goes slow through this sequence right here. When the ribosome is covering up one, one can't pair with two, so two pairs with three. And when two pairs with three, three can't pair with four, no termination. Okay? Pretty cool. On the other hand, when there's plenty of tryptophan, the ribosome, amazingly enough, can go slithering through this whole thing, and it doesn't stop at, at, at the UGGs. It just goes on and does its thing. Consequently, one can pair with two, which leaves three to pair with four, and we get termination. So the amount of tryptophan that's present will determine whether that forms or that forms. Low tryptophan, slow ribosome. High tryptophan, fast ribosome. Slow ribosome no, uh, forms two and three. Fast ribosome lets three and four to pair. Clear as mud? I'll slow down. The ultimate use, oh, that's a very good question. The ultimate usefulness of that is that when tryptophan is high, the operon won't be made. When tryptophan is low, the operon will be made, and then the cell will be able to make more tryptophan. Now, as I said, this is an odd-looking thing. You think, why has he made us, make, made us learn an odd-looking control thing? It turns out that this is not the only operon in E. coli that uses this. Other amino acid operons do exactly the same thing. Valine operon. Instead of having a tryptophan tryptophan there, it has four or five valines right there. 
same phenomenon. Exactly the same thing happens. Isoleucine. Exactly the same thing happens. So this system is very efficient because it's giving the cell a very good measure of whether or not we need to make this operon. Okay. Yes? So translation is starting while transcription is going on. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Is that, was that, was that your question? Yes. And this will only happen in bacteria because only in bacteria are transcription and translation occurring at the same time. Can't occur in us because we've got translation going on in the cytoplasm, whereas transcription is going on in the nucleus. Now, if you guys grab that, that's pretty cool. I'm not. Yes. Say it again. The attenuator is basically what you see on the screen. The attenuator is basically what you see on the screen. Pretty cool. You might, people frequently ask me the question, well, why even make a messenger RNA at all? Isn't that wasting energy? And the answer to that question is, there are no perfect systems. We would like to design a perfect system, okay, and figure out it works 100% of the time, and it's very logical and efficient. But it turns out that this system happens to work very well. And evidence that it works very well is witnessed by the fact that several other operons use exactly the same thing. So the cell loses a little bit of energy. It's making a messenger RNA that's not very useful to it. But it's willing to sacrifice the energy necessary for that by having the ability to control and make the proper amount of proteins for making the uh, needed amino acids. Yes? So is that happening all the time and so low? This guy is always being made. That's correct. It's always being made. So the question is, is it being made and stopping, or is it being made and continuing? These are, these are, yeah, this is the same, this sequence is the same as this sequence. So this sequence is in it, part of the attenuator, that's correct. All right, you guys are looking a little tired. Should we do a song? Okay. Let's do a song. This is a song that's easy to sing. I want to hear you guys loud. Everybody ready? It's called transcription. Phosphodiesters are the bonds of RNA that support a ribopolymer made of GCU and A. The RNA polymerase binds to a Tata box and copies from the template strand all along the way it walks. Initiation of transcription thus proceeds from the close to open complexing in the DNA it reads. The sigma factor gets released, its work is over fast. Polymerase can then advance after this step has been passed. In elongation, the polymerizing spree moves along the way and fits and starts synthesizing 5, 2, 3. The RNA is floppy and it dangles from one end. Oh, that's a most important thing for you to comprehend. Then termination finishes the RNAs. Thanks to protein row or hairpin forms that release polymerase. So this describes transcription steps in three-part harmonies. Here's hoping with this melody you can learn it all with ease. And let's go out and enjoy the sun. <laughs>